You're listening to Trace Elements Radio. We are live today, Thursday, 25th of February. And I have to tell you, I am so pissed off right now. So pissed off. Let's talk about genocide. It's an intent to systematically eliminate a racial, ethnic, religious, linguistic, cultural, or national group. Relatively new term, believe it or not, didn't exist prior to 1944. It's very, very specific about violent crimes. We are seeing this happen in Canada. Canada, right at this very moment. And it's simply unacceptable to me that any community in this day and age should have to declare a state of emergency in order to get help or attention, basic attention in this province, Ontario. The Anishinaabek, Aski Nation, communities specifically in the Sioux Lookout region, Ontario, have declared a state of emergency on Wednesday, left to appeal to both provincial and federal liberal governments to finally act on long-known crisis of access to acute health care, basic clean water, housing fit, for habitation, mental health supports to prevent suicides, especially amongst young people, and I mean babies. Children are killing themselves. It's simply unacceptable how an entirely preventative, potentially deadly infection, such as rheumatic fever, should be the stuff of a Dickens tale. It is not only present in communities near Sioux Lookout, but exists here at the highest rate on this planet. There are MRSA infections because the water is unfit for human consumption. High and preventable rates of diabetes, an epidemic of children committing suicide. We're going into this today, and let me tell you, words cannot express. Because the First Nations here, on this continent, but specifically in this country, have greater health concerns, but receive less health care than people in the rest of Canada, and it's looking like now on the rest of this planet. It's atrocious how people are being treated. Now, people in remote First Nations are routinely denied access to health care by Health Canada's non-insured health benefits program. Health Canada recently denied 17 of 22 children under 7 years old even access to a pediatrician even though they were referred to by a doctor because of developmental issues. That's just one example. We need an investment and an intervention plan for the treatment of people on this continent by both Health Canada and Ontario's Ministry of Health. Bad water basically is leading to the high rates of invasive infections going on right now. Rheumatic fever in some First Nations are 75 times higher than in the rest of this continent. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Three quarters of First Nations have been under 
at least one water advisory between 1999 and 2016. All First Nations communities, and note there are over 600 of them here. And mostly for the last decade that they've been talking about it. This has been revealed, these are facts. Numbers show that 400 out of the, okay, 618 First Nations in this country have a water problem right now. The longest running water advisory is the Nekishtanka First Nation in Ontario, where residents have been boiling their water for 20 years. The Nazco First Nation Alexis Creek First Nation, the Lake Bebney, all in British Columbia, are next on the list with water problems spanning over 16 years for sure. Because running water is a luxury on many First Nations reserves. Life is revolving around getting clean water. 93% of all the First Nations in Saskatchewan and New Brunswick, 93% have been under a water advisory since 2004. Alberta is really close, 87%. The lowest provincial rate is actually 51%. That's in Manitoba over half there. Variety of factors trigger these things, ranging from bad pipe connections, low pressure, improper filtration and disinfection, right up to contamination with bacteria. Most of the common kind of advisory is what they're calling boil water advisory. It's absolutely outrageous that very absolute necessity of life is being denied to a whole group of people in a country as wealthy as this. You end up with a real sense of despair and stress in these communities. We are made of water. We feel when water's wrong. It affects us mentally, physically, emotionally. And it could be alleviated by one simple promise. Provide everyone with a good glass of water. Stop discriminating in service provision. On any given day, official water advisories on First Nations, at least 150 or more. And even though experts are saying they can't pin down the exact number or the reason it's climbed over the last decade. It's getting worse, not better. Governments have spent two billion dollars apparently on the issue since 2001 and 2013 but we have no idea where that money's going. The problems severe or worse percentages across this country are ridiculously high. Ten years ago, they were at 30% of the water treatment systems in First Nations posed, but they're saying a high to extreme risk of safety. Today, the numbers are the exact same or worse. Chronic government malfeasance under funding of water systems is to blame for this lack of process. The money that's being spent is not getting to the people who need it. In the interior of BC, the Nazco First Nation, again, under a water advisory for 16 years. Upsetting. We live in Canada, but on a reserve, it is third world conditions. Drinking bathing, 
it's appalling to have these conditions here. And even though $3.5 million went to fixing one system, one system, a couple years ago, the water advisory was never alleviated. And of course, the project was executed for failure. They always take the easiest route. They spend money, but did not put anyone on the ground. They filtered out money so that it could look like they were dealing with the issue. But there was no project manager on the ground to actually oversee if anything was done or even report to the Department of Aboriginal Affairs. None of that happened. The water system has been plagued with problems from the beginning, ranging from bad connections to a lack of training. In Manitoba, one First Nation has been under advisory for 859 days. An order that affects just the arena and the gas bar. Residents distrust the quality of water, tap water, in their own homes so much that most pick up bottles of drinking water from the treatment plant. If this was in a town or a municipality anywhere else in Canada or perhaps on this planet, the news would be all over this. You think you have problems in the States? It's ridiculous with all the water we have here that this should be going on. Years of brown bath water, bottled water, boiling kettles, harsh chlorine that's been used to kill bacteria has also ruined people's, well, laundry, skin, hair, teeth. Most places are doing this on their own time, their own dime. And of course, the people that are stepping up to deal with their community's problems are actually getting blamed for the problem itself. Now, of course, the drinking water advisory can affect as little as one building. Canada is saying, at least on their Health Canada website, that it does not always represent a problem with the entire water system in a community. That is bullshit. Health Canada has denied, declined over and over and over again, even interviews to talk about this. It's disgusting what's happening here. Absolutely disgusting. Now, because of these issues, in the last five years, cases of hepatitis C have increased to 200 from two in the last five years. In the First Nations north of Sioux Lookout, and this is one tiny little place in Ontario. First Nations people who live in a jurisdictional black hole. And it's time to change that now. The Anishinaabe Aski Nation and the Sioux Lookout Area Chiefs Committee on Health declared the public health and the health emergency. Wednesday. This is urgent and long-standing issues that Canada is not addressing. Declaration is to address this urgent issue. Amongst other recent health concerns in the area, like rheumatic fever, people living in remote nations, are experiencing acute rheumatic fever at a rate that is the highest in the world. In the world. Researchers identified eight cases of acute rheumatic fever 
amongst 25,000 patients in one region during an 18-month period ending March 1st, 2015. That marks an incident rate of 21.3 per 100,000, so 75 times greater than anyone in Canada. And invasive infections, bad water, inadequate housing are leading to dramatic increase in all invasive diseases. Northwestern Ontario. Home to 10, 10 remote First Nations that haven't had safe water in more than a decade are now seeing the highest rates of community associated MRSA in Canada and limited access to health care. Health Canada provides health services on reserves. None of the First Nations north of Sioux Lookout have resident doctors and people rely on nursing stations for their primary health care. An Auditor General's report last year, 2015, showed that only one of 45 nurses surveyed had completed even the mandatory training courses and that nurses sometimes work outside their legislative scope of practice. A report found that Health Canada had not accessed the capacity of nursing stations to provide essential services here. Not even essential ones. These problems, of course. With everything else, the suicide rate for children under 15 in Ontario First Nations is more than 75 times the national average. Some say 50, but that's bullshit. It's bullshit. First Nations in North Ontario are calling for emergency relief after several young children, children, including a 10-year-old girl, died in suicide in the last couple weeks. Northwest Local Health Integration Network report from 2010 showed the suicide rate for some First Nations in the area, again, at least 50 times the Canadian average for children under 15 years old. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I haven't seen a child under 15 years old, not on a reserve, kill themselves in Canada. I don't remember reading a report like that. Not one. Now the meeting of the chiefs from 49 First Nations that make up the Nishnabe Aski Nation again this week in Thunder Bay with prayers for the families of five youth who have died in suicide since December, December last year. As a matter of fact, more than one in five off-reserve Aboriginal adults have committed suicide. So it doesn't get easier if you leave the reserve. Many of these are young girls and are babies. Noting that two children, 10 years old, have died by suicide in the last two years. I can't imagine what these families and these communities are going through. To bury a 10-year-old child that died by suicide is something I can't even comprehend. That the recent suicide took place and again, one of the same communities where a 14-year-old girl died January 9th. You don't expect a 14-year-old to be lost in that way. No one expected it. It has been difficult, the community says, and they had to pull together. In the past 10 years, they have lost 13 people to suicide. Few people remain untouched by grief. 
These are small, intimate communities. And the girl who died recently, it's just tragic. So these communities are in a state of crisis. This brings back a lot of flashbacks, including including what's happening with the staff there. Many chiefs are calling for emergency response to the suicides and similar ways that governments respond to other disasters, such as a flood or a forest fire, or if this was happening in a fucking city with white people, this shit would have been taken care of. I'm sorry, I'm really pissed off right now. I am so sick of this racist bullshit. We have learned nothing, nothing here. You worry about sovereignty and you can't even deep breath. It's not your land. This isn't your country. It will never belong to you. Do you understand that? The land does not belong to you. It will never belong to you. Ever. There's nothing you can do to make me believe that the land you sit on is yours. There's nothing you can say to me that makes this okay. Nothing. It's disgusting what people are doing. Disgusting. It really is. On most of these First Nations, leaving is not a fucking option. You can't. You need money to leave. And if you leave, if you go to school, you're going to get your ass kicked by the white kids. Kids go disappearing faster if you're native, which I look, by the way, everyone sees me and all they see is native. And let's talk about the people who actually do leave. Let's talk about them. Because more than one in five Aboriginal adults living off reserve have at least contemplated suicide. Because it doesn't get easier being in a city. The drug trafficking on reserves, horrific, obviously, and paid for by Canada, the government. Let's talk about why leaving most of the reserves is not an option. So why why don't they just leave? Why don't they just leave? When a seven-year-old has just tried to commit suicide, luckily didn't finish. Yeah, it's not the same thing, Noreen. It's not the same thing. No one is stopping them from exiting conditions of life that exist where the community is. We hear this shit all the time. They can move wherever they want. Okay, so here's some reasons offered by people who actually live on reserves and are actually native, not people who aren't native talking about what it's going to be like to be native because you don't know. You don't. You don't know what it's like to be black. You don't know what it's like to be native, and you don't know what it's like to have to face down the police here and know that they can kill you and get away with it. And the racism that happens every fucking day, you leave your house. You don't get it. You don't. You absolutely do not get it. So... Let's talk to people who actually have lived this life. Leaving your home requires financial ability, a support system. Not only do you have to find a place to go and a way to get there, you have to ensure you can afford it, land a job there. 
Starting over isn't easy for anyone, obviously. Moving sucks in general. It doesn't matter what you are. And if you're coming from a place of poverty, it's almost impossible. Okay, another one. This is from Ed Cardinal. And thanks, Ed, for sending this to me. People saw that I was really pissed off this morning. You have no idea how pissed off I am. Because I am. I am. How I look. And I'm not full native, but, you know, people look at me, they see native. Even though I'm mixed as hell. I'm practically the mixed master. My son laughs at it. It's dangerous for me to leave the house and go downtown. In Canada, I am more likely to die at the hand of a stranger than to go to college, have a job, get married, have a grandchild. No, it's more likely that I'm going to be killed. by the serial killers that they allow to rampage here. So, Ed, thank you again. Many who do leave are more often than not intimidated by their surroundings, have no actual experience speaking to waifu, to a job market. Well, even simply a labor job will have more often than not to be passed over to someone else as many do not wish to have us brown skinned people especially brown skinned people who look native and in Canada and we have to be honest about that you have it you have a different voice if you're on been on a reserve they speak differently they can be pointed out. You know when someone is coming off reserve. You just do. And I'm I'm trying not to be racist about this, but you do, and you know. So you can be picked out. You can be targeted. So many just don't want us working for them. People make things sound easy when it is very difficult. To get housing. Even if they could pick up, and this is from Bobby Dirksen. Again, native. And the reason why we have names like Bobby Dirksen is colonization, people. We would not be called Bobby or Dirksen without the rape and the genocide by rape happening here. Now, of course, some of it's love. I'm not saying it's all been rape. But he no longer has a native name that means something. It's important. It is important. But anyway, Bobby. Even if we could pick up and leave, who will cut the firewood for your grandparents? Who will take your auntie to town for groceries? or to a doctor's appointment? Who will help their cousin with a new baby? Who will run the kids' volleyball? Who will run the kids' hockey programs? People are needed in their communities. But what is truly needed is hope for a better future, which we are not seeing. From Joe Warden. If your kids are killing your, themselves out of sociological conditions what choice do you have but to move where the future is more hope legitimate question I understand but you gotta leave all your family and people where you actually will be accepted it's not that easy I get that I get that and I understand now Molly Isaac responded to that She said, what choice? You have the choice to stay in your homeland, stay against the undercurrent for your legal and inherent rights, with the hope that one day, 
they will be fully acknowledged and respected so children of the future generations will have the freedom and the choice never to become victims of colonist policies of imposed poverty, dislocation, or assimilation again, but that's not looking too good. Running away from your problems doesn't work. Moving somewhere else won't erase or solve depression, painful memories. Healing takes time, dedication, and kudos for recognizing a need for help, being strong enough to ask for it. I'm taking a breath. <laughs> Sorry, I'm reading. Uh, I'm reading. Please stop sending me so many messages. I'm trying to talk right now. Thank you. And yes, thank you for the support, darlings. <laughs> now. The deplorable health conditions which I've talked about before in Indigenous Leaders, and we hate that name, by the way, are saying these need to be confronted. First Nations adults are more than twice as likely to die from avoidable causes. And racism against Aboriginal people here is obvious, pervasive, insidious. When I sit and I listen to people talk about our country and the problem with the immigrants, I'm like, boy, what tribe are you from? <laughs> yeah, immigration's a fucking problem. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm going to watch watch my mouth. I'm gonna play I'm gonna play some music and I'm gonna calm the hell down. How would I do that? Play music. Calming down. Be right back. It's funny, I got I got so pissed off my computer overheated. Okay, so I'm calm. I'm calm. Uh. It's really important for everyone to look at the truth here. Seriously. Because we are in an era of what they call truth and reconciliation. I think it's a major issue. Because if it wasn't for the Indian Act, if it wasn't for the residential schools, if it wasn't for the colonial policy, the health conditions of our people wouldn't be in this state. Aboriginal peoples face serious health challenges, including high rates of chronic, contagious diseases, shorter lifespans, and don't, well wait, we, we are going to go there, we're going to go up to Callaway, where it's going to cost you $85 to buy Kentucky Fried Chicken and chicken rots in their stomachs. They were never meant to eat this craft food. Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, which is supposed to be gone. For example, five times higher amongst First Nations people, 55 times higher amongst Inuit population, There is an also an estimated 278 new HIV infections that occurred in a population in one year, 2014. And they die in six months. One of the native nurses that I had spoken to from you guys remember in 2012 when I went to go see Gerald Whitehorse standing? The nurse said that 
they have this HIV strain that no one's talking about that kills in three months. And the suicide rates amongst the Inuits which are very serious concerns should be an absolute friggin' priority. If you want to be called a nation, a country, a continent, a people, sovereignty my ass. You can't be sovereign when people are dying like this. You can't be sovereign when you can't drink from your taps. You can't. And they gotta bathe in that shit. Or sometimes walk miles with a friggin' bucket in Canada in the winter. We're having a storm right now. I guess um, most of eastern Canada is without um, friggin' power right now. Luckily I have power. Luckily I have power. So how do we address these things? How do we how do we address them? Because our first peoples live in conditions that are predicted on a hundred and fifty plus years of unjust colonial practices that have implications over generations. And let's be honest, most people, most native people have no idea what their people believed. They're Christian now. Christian. Because that's not a fucking problem. <coughs> sorry, 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 sorry. We had beliefs. We had lives here. Sure, it wasn't perfect. We had gone through what seems as the world world gone through at around the same time where men took over. Men are great. I love men. Protective. Nurturing. Caring. Loving. But what this colonization has done has turned people into monsters. Monsters. So that any part of real thought, real connection is gone. Let's be honest here. Centuries. The zoos that are having problems right now had actual people in it. In 1893, a group of indigenous men traveled to the United States so they could be put on display in the 1893 Chicago World's Fair Columbian Exposition, which celebrated the 400th year of Columbus's arrival to the Americas. researching their story, you delve into a history of indigenous people brought to the United States, brought to Europe, put on display in what they called human zoos. First peoples from all over the world were brought to be displayed at fairs and circuses during the 1800s, 1900s. Why were they so popular? And most historians who study these exhibits agree they were a way of reinforcing, illustrating racist notions of white supremacy. And I saw your little white DNA. You, you kids are dusty. <laughs> Each and every one of you. You're a little dusty. Anyway, that seemed to be built into the logic of an empire, the logic of colonization, which still exists right now. And most nations took great care to try and mold the people 
they put on display into the images that justified their own colonization and the colonial power structure. In some cases, this meant trying to create savages. In other cases, they tried to use these displays of human beings to illustrate how colonial presence was civilizing these poor people who actually lived longer, were taller than the people in Europe who were freaking suffering in the 1800s. Now these exhibits also played into forms of popular entertainment. They are a mix of imperial ambition and circus. So I study this small group. People from Bolivia who were brought to the United States, New York specifically, to be displayed for this Chicago fair, but got stranded in New York. You want to hear what happened to these people? These men, men this time, brought to the United States, displayed at the Chicago's World Fair, 1893 never made it to Chicago. They attempted to make a living putting on musical shows in the entertainment in New York and Philadelphia. But everywhere they went, they were basically told they weren't exotic enough. After an unsuccessful tour with a circus through Philadelphia, playing, of course, the savage, the group was abandoned by their managers. And one member of the group dubbed the giant by the press died shortly after they walked back to New York City. The rest of the group eventually found work in fairs and on Coney Island, but could not work making feather headdresses. Oh, one of them got that job. And another performing supposed North American native dances for a New York audience. They struggle to make their way back to Bolivia. I've only been able to trace them as far as Panama, though, on their return journey. How is what these people went through, similar to other experiences of imported indigenous people who came to the United States. Their story definitely sounds exceptional, but what's really shocking about the history of these human zoos is that it isn't exceptional. One study I read estimated that more than 25,000 indigenous people were brought to fairs around the world up until 1930s. Some say as late as the 1950s, but it's hard to get data on that. These people struggled under harsh and changing conditions. Many of them changed their hair and their clothes, their entire outfit, their appearance, to fit the expectations of organizations and audiences that they were supposed to perform for. Some people died as targets of racist violence while they were on display. Others experienced a far subtler form of violence. That new term they use now, what's it called? Micro-racism and were used as subjects of scientific study on the racial differences during the exhibition. But the majority of them died during these expeditions. Exhibitions to entertain you. And the first peoples from Turtle Island here 
This is freaking America, and this is not Canada. It never will be. It never was. It never is a place that existed. It, these are corporations. Who own your ass? I don't care what your little color is. Exhibited alongside people from other continents was the logic behind exhibiting indigenous people from the United States similar to the logic behind exhibiting indigenous people from other countries. The U.S. government resisted allowing official exhibits of North American indigenous people after, well, until after Wounded Knee. So 1890, and viewed shows like Buffalo Bills, Wild West Show, as either semi-threatening glorification of Native Americas, or a crass, unscientific form of entertainment. The U.S. preferred exhibits that showed Native Americans as passive, weak, comical figures like the minstrels that they did to black people. Well, they still do that to black people. Because that's what you're doing if you sing for them. That's what you're doing if you're getting your head bashed in while you fight for them or carry a little ball around. You get concussions, micro lesions in your brain, but that's okay. You're entertaining. But for example, in Chicago, the organizations and organizers worked with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. People are supposed to help you people. We'll be back. <laughs>